Good morning, new day, new lesson, new chapter. We're going to be looking at pure chapter six today and these next four lessons, including this one, which are all on circles. So chapter six in the algebra book, we'll find lots and lots of excellent work examples on circles. So rather than duplicating those examples, I'm going to put some new ones in for you here, which have been taken from exam papers. So they're new in a sense, you won't have seen them, not new in a sense, they've actually been recycled from exams which people before you have done just to give you a feel of the standard needed today we're going to take it from first principles so we're going to be having a look at the equation of a circle based on intuition and a bit of knowledge from transformations of graphs from last chapter and we're going to just gently be reminded of one or two circle theorems which you'll need to know although you won't need to prove them for a level so before we get started proper Let's have a look at the warm-up questions for today. So normally it's one, two, three, four. Today I've just got one, two, and three. However, question three is parts A, B, and C, I suppose. So as ever, try these yourselves. Only use this video to help to see if you've gone wrong or to lead you through if you're really not understanding them. But always try them yourself in the first instance. Use a video secondly to help you see where you may have gone wrong or to verify your answers if they are right. So have a go at these, then play the video. So let's have a look together now at question one. Question one, we need to prove that the line y equals 2x plus 1 does not intersect with a curve y equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 5. What we can do first of all is notice that this is easy to substitute. So we could substitute in y is 2x plus 1 into this at the bottom. So if we do that, the bottom equation y equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 5 becomes 2x plus 1 equals 2x squared minus 3x plus 5. We can now rearrange this into the standard quadratic form ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero by subtracting away this 2x plus 1 from both sides. I'll just colour code so you can see where this has come from in the first instance. So we're going to subtract this 2x plus 1 from both sides. So on the right we're going to have 2x squared minus 3x minus another 2x, that becomes minus 5x. And plus 5 minus this 1 becomes plus 4 and that equals zero. So this is a quadratic. How do we know how many solutions a quadratic equation has? You need to remember that we can use a discriminant test for this. If you remember the discriminant, which has the symbol, which is a triangle, that equals b squared minus 4ac. When the discriminant is greater than zero, we have two distinct solutions. When it's equal to zero, we have one repeated solution when this discriminant is less than zero, the equation has no solutions at all. And so what do we mean by b? What we mean by b is the coefficient of the x. So in our case, b is minus 5. a is the coefficient of the x squared term, which is 2. And c is the constant term, which we have is positive 4. So we can substitute in these values to work out the value of a discriminant for this question. And so b squared, that's going to become minus 5. So we have minus 5 all squared. And minus 4 times 2 times 4. Okay, because b was minus 5, a was 2, and c was 4. And so if we just work this out now, just calculate it, minus 5 all squared is 25. Then minus 4 times 2 times 4, that's 32. 25 minus 32, you could use your calculator as well, of course, that gives you minus 7, and importantly, that's less than 0. Therefore, this quadratic here has no solutions, what this means in our case is that this graph will never meet this graph. No solutions, 
they never coincide. So therefore, they do not intersect. No points of intersection. We're going to move on now to question two, because unsurprisingly, question two often follows question one. And we can use a similar idea for question two. So question two, show that the line 3x minus y plus 2 equals 0 is tangential to the curve y equals x squared minus 3x plus 11. So this tangential word, don't let it throw you too much, okay? I'm just going to show you what it means. So this curve here is a quadratic, as you can see. Um, so if I were to very crudely sketch a quadratic, sort of a u-shape so the quadratic is something a bit like that okay and a tangent is going to be a straight line so if I imagine a tangent being drawn to this it'd be something that looks like that in other words all that would happen is it would have one point of intersection here in other words we're after one repeated solution to these simultaneous equations. Now I did mention it's similar to question one because we can use pretty much the same method involving the discriminant. First of all what I want to do though is to rearrange this equation here into y equals, make y the subject. So if we do that what we're going to get here is that y equals 3x plus 2. We can now sub this in to the bottom equation here. So this bottom equation is going to become 3x plus 2 equals x squared minus 3x plus 11. We can now subtract off the 3x and this plus 2 from both sides and we can arrive at x squared minus 6x plus 9 equals 0. Okay, now at this point, you could go one of two ways. I'm going to use a discriminant again like we did last time, but I'm also just going to section this off and show you at this point how we could have used a completely different, well not completely different, but very much a different idea. And so if I hop this over to here, I'm going to show you afterwards a second method we could have employed. But first of all, let's just use the discriminant like we did for the first one. So if we remember what the discriminant is, discriminant is b squared minus 4ac. And if a line is tangential, it's only going to meet the curve at one place, so it's going to have one solution. So this discriminant here must be exactly equal to zero if it has only one solution exactly. So using this equation here, b is the coefficient of the x term, and so for b in this case is minus 6. So we have minus 6 all squared. and minus 4 times a. a is a coefficient of the x squared. As you can see here, there's nothing in front of the x squared, so you can imagine it to be like an invisible 1. So a is 1, and c is the constant term at the end. So our c is 9. So minus 6 all squared is 36. Minus 4 times 1 times 9. 4 times 1 times 9 is 36. 36 minus 36 equals 0. That tells us that there's only one solution. So in other words, we can say, therefore, only one solution. Now, if there's only one solution, that can only happen if the line is a tangent. So the line must be 
tangential, to use the word from the question, to the curve. If this discriminant had have been less than zero, the line would never have met the curve at all. If the value of a discriminant had have been positive, this blue straight line would have cut across the curve at two distinct different points. Now I did mention there's another way of tackling this one. So instead of using the discriminant, let's see if we could have done something else here. Generally speaking, if something can factorise, it's often a good idea to see if it can and what we get if it does. This does indeed factorise. So two numbers that multiply to nine and add to minus six and minus three and minus three. This would have factorised into minus three, sorry, x minus three all squared equals zero. So when is this bracket equal to zero? That's only going to work at one particular point. So this shows you that there's only going to be one point only. Only one point, and that point is when x is free. Where the line meets the curve. So that's one way of saying that, in other words, the line must be a tangent to the curve. So therefore the line must be tangential to the curve. Question three, we've got some graph transformations to do. I've left out the uh, ex explanation from the warm-up sheet, but all we need to do here is to do these transformations and then label on where the coordinates end up. So this first one, we've got y is f of x translated to f of x plus 1. This change happens inside the brackets, and so if it happens inside the brackets, it affects the x coordinates only in an opposite common sense way. So rather than the x coordinates having one added to them, we're going to subtract one from each x coordinate. In other words, this graph is going to move one unit to the left. And so it was here, it's going to slide along one unit to the left to here. So what's going to happen is one zero is going to become zero zero. We just knock one off this x coordinate. And four zero becomes three zero. This point here is going to be somewhere along there. It's not going to be intersecting the y or the x-axis, so we don't need to label this one. The only two we need to label we've got here. The next one, y of f of x is become y of two f of x. Here the change happens on the outside of the brackets. We have 1fx here, becomes 2fx over here. We need to remember from the previous chapter, when the change is on the outside of the brackets, it affects the y-axis only in a completely common sense way. And so f of x is multiplied by 2, so we stretch the graph, scale factor 2, in this y-direction. The x-coordinates don't move, the y-coordinates double. So all we need to do here is to take our curve and stretch it, not horizontally, but vertically. We're going to give it a vertical stretch, like so. So 1, 0 wouldn't move, because the y-coordinate here is 0. So I'm going to double 0, that stays at 0. Same over here. So 1, 0 and 4, 0 will stay exactly as they are, which will be somewhere like this. So we label these on so we can show that they've not moved. Uh, 
and that's 4, 0. However, the y-axis intercept, 0, 3, this 3 is going to double to 6. And for part C, we've gone from f of x to f of half of x, and so this change happens inside the brackets. Remember, if a change happens inside the brackets, it affects the x coordinates only in an opposite to common sense way. So rather than the x coordinates being halved, rather than the x coordinates being divided by 2, the x coordinates are going to be multiplied by 2. Instead of halving, like you might think using common sense, the x coordinates are going to double. So what this means is f of x is going to be stretched scale factor 2 in the x direction. And so our graph here is going to undergo a stretch in this direction here, like so. So the y coordinates for each point aren't going to change. So 0, 3 will still be at 0, 3. And the x coordinates double. So if we double 0, as I've said before, that will just stay as it is. So 0, 3 is an invariant point. It doesn't change. 1, 0, though, does move along. For 1 doubles to a 2. And 4 doubles to an 8. Now, I've not done this quite to scale. This is a sketch. If I did this to scale, this 4, 0 point would be off the page down here. But as long as you're making it clear to the examiner that you've stretched it, and to be honest, the newly labelled coordinates show the stretch, as long as you get these coordinates written out correctly. So that's all of the warm-up questions done. So we can now move on to having a look and having a think about these circle problems. Let's just have a think about how we can apply some of the things we learnt from coordinate geometry and straight lines to circle geometry. So what I mean by this is that we can think about the midpoints of line segments, which we did at the very last stage of the chapter on straight lines. Uh, we can apply this to circle geometry as well. Um, so for example, if you're given a line segment and we were told that that line segment is a diameter of a circle, then fairly obviously we can work out the midpoint of that and the midpoint would correspond to the centre of that circle. So just applying this, imagine we had a line segment AB, which we were told is a diameter of a circle, where A and B are 7, 11, and minus 3, 5, respectively. So we could find the coordinates of the centre of that circle by finding out the midpoint of AB. So let's do this now. So the circle centre, that's going to be the same thing as the midpoint of AB. So to look at the midpoint of a line segment, what we do is we average out the x values of a and b. So it's going to be x of a plus x of b divided by 2. And average out the y value of a and the y value of b as well in the same way. Now, if you're working out this question in an exam, you don't need to write out what I've just wrote out there. I'm just reminding you where these numbers are going to be coming from. And so the x value at a is 7. And the x value at y is minus 3. In the same way, the y value at a is 11. And the y value at b is 5. So we do 11 plus 5 over 2. So I'll just colour code where these values have come from. And so the x value at a is 7, hence this 7 here. The x value at b is minus 3, hence that minus 3 there. The y value at a is 11, hence the 11 here. And finally, the y value at b was 5, hence this 5 here. So it's just a case of just simple substitution. 
So now we can just calculate this now. So 7 plus minus 3 is 4. 4 divided by 2 is 2. And over here, 11 plus 5 is 16. 16 divided by 2 is 8. So the midpoint of this circle would be 2, 8. Let's now have a look at worked example 2, which is similar, but with a twist. Worked example 2, again, we've been given a line segment CD. Again, we've been told it's a diameter of the circle, where C is 2, 10. So given that the centre of the circle is minus 2, 1, find the coordinates of D. Now, this is different from worked example 1, because here we're told one end of the diameter and the centre of the circle. So in other words, we've been told one end of the diameter and the midpoint of that diameter. The midpoint of the diameter is, of course, the circle centre. I'm going to show you two different ways of doing this. We can use the formula like we did earlier for worked example one. I'm going to show you how to do that first. Now, this method I'm going to show you first is not my preferred method, but I'm going to show you it anyway in case you might like it. The second method's my favourite. So anyway, let's use the midpoint idea. So the midpoint of CD, which is the centre of the circle, that's going to be calculated by averaging out the x coordinates of C and D. So that's xc plus xd over 2. And do the same with the y values, so yc plus yd over 2. But of course here, we know the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate at c. So the x-coordinate of c is 2. And the y-coordinate of C is 10. So we can substitute these values in. So x at C is 2. x at D we don't know yet. And y at C is 10. Plus y of D, which we don't know yet. But again, we can work this out soon. All over 2. And, of course, we know that the centre of a circle, we know the centre of a circle is minus 2, 1. So that's the same as minus 2, 1. So what we can do here now is to formulate two equations to work out the x-coordinate of D and the y-coordinate of D. Because this here, this expression, must be equal to minus 2. And in pretty much the same way, the expression for the y-coordinate here must be equal to 1. So let's do the x-coordinates first. So we can say that 2 plus x at d all over 2 must equal minus 2. We can now solve this pretty easily. If we multiply both sides by 2, we get 2 plus x of d equals minus 4. Therefore, the x-coordinate at d is going to be minus 4 minus another 2, which is minus 6. We can now do similar for the y-coordinates. So 10 plus y at d divided by 2 must equal 1. If we multiply both sides by 2, we get 10 plus y of d equals 2. Finally, we can subtract 10 from both sides. We get that y at d must be 2 minus 10, which is minus 8. So we know the x-coordinate at d is minus 6. We know the y-coordinate at d is minus 8, so therefore we know what d is. So therefore, simply put, d must be minus 6 minus 8. That's one way of doing it. I'm going to show you a second way now. 
this is more pictorial, more visual. So we could start, because now it's a circle problem, we could start off by just drawing a circle. So let's just fill in step by step what we're told in this question. So first of all, we're told that the centre of the circle is minus 2, 1. So we can add this into our diagram. Next up, we know that C of this diameter, 1 in the diameter is at 2, 10. So it doesn't really matter where about you draw it, it's just a sketch, remember. So just label on a point which we can say is C, 2, 10. So I'm going to put 2, 10 over here. So next up, we need to be thinking about something else. We're told that CD is a diameter of a circle. And so if C is here, and the centre is here, D will be at the other side, down here. So again, because it's just a sketch, it doesn't matter if C was a bit to the left or a bit to the right, but using this sketch, if CD makes a diameter, we can do D at the other side, like so. Now it's just a case of working out what D is by thinking about the distance from C to the center. So let's think about this now, just think about from C to the center. So C, the x coordinate goes from 2 at C to minus 2 at the center. From 2 along to minus 2, we've gone along to the left by 4 units. In the same way, look at the y coordinates. We've gone from 10 down to 1, so the y value has gone down by 9. So halfway along the diameter, we go along 4 and down 9. So to go from the centre down to the other end, it stands to reason it will be along another 4 and down another 9, like so. And so just carrying on this pattern again, we know that D must be minus 2 minus another 4. Minus 2 minus 4 gives us minus 6. And the y coordinate, 1 minus another 9, 1 minus 9 is minus 8. So that's, that's the method I prefer. I'm not trying to influence what you prefer. You'll prefer what you prefer. I'm just saying that for me personally is a method I tend to prefer. So let's move on to a bit more. So work for example three, we've got a line segment AB, which is a diameter of the circle center C. And we've got A and B and minus 1, 4 and 5, 2, respectively. The line L passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. Find the equation of L. So I'm sure you'll agree, without doing a diagram, this is just information overload. And so normally, not always, but normally, a diagram will help with questions like this. Circle geometry, line geometry, in fact, generally geometry at all. Diagrams are incredibly powerful. So start off, I would suggest, by drawing a circle out. So I've put a red dot wherever the centre is. So let's just pick apart this question and label in what we know. So first off, I would suggest we know that we've got a point A and B, and we know that A is minus 1, 4. So let's label on roughly where A might be. So I've put A here. Now B is 5, which is to the right of minus 1, and down slightly from 4. And so B, I'm going to label in as well. So B in green, coloured in green here. We also saw that AB is a diameter. And so from A to B has to be a straight line uh, going through the centre. So there we go. As well as that, we also saw that line L passes through C and is perpendicular to AB. So we're going to have a straight line going through the centre, which is at right angles to AB. So let's draw this in. So I've labelled this line L. So we need to find the equation of L. So this, actually now we've got it all labelled on, this just becomes a straight line question. And so the circle is only there to set up the problem. So we need to remember from the chapter on straight lines what happens with the gradient of perpendicular lines. So what I'd suggest we do first of all is work out the gradient of the line AB. So the gradient as you move from A to B 
is, as ever, the change in y divided by the change in x. And so y ends up being 2, it was 4, so we've got 2 minus 4, and the change in x, x ends up being 5, it was minus 1. So 5 minus minus 1. 2 minus 4 is minus 2. 5 minus minus 1, 5 plus 1 is 6, so that's minus a third. So negative gradient, that looks reasonable because the line is going downwards. However, the gradient of L, L is perpendicular to AB. So the gradient of L, we need to remember the properties of two lines which are perpendicular. The gradient of one of them is always the negative reciprocal of the gradient of the other. To put it a different way, the products of the gradients of two perpendicular lines will always equal minus one. So in our case, we could rearrange that and say that the gradient of L is minus one over the gradient of AB. So that's going to be minus one over minus a third. Again, do this on the calculator if it looks slightly confusing. Minus one over minus a third though, the minuses cancel. One divided by a third, how many thirds fit into one? It's going to be three. So we know now that the gradient of L is going to be three. We could also do with knowing any point along this line L. Now the most obvious point I can think of is the centre of the circle. And so what is going to be this centre here? So let's work this out. The centre of the circle is going to be the midpoint of AB. So we can work this out secondly. So the midpoint of AB, we're just going to average out the coordinates of A and B. So the x coordinate of A is minus 1, the x coordinate of B is 5. So minus 1 plus 5 all over 2. And the y coordinates 4 plus 2 all over 2. And so that's going to become 2, 3. So we know the gradient of this line L is 3. We know a point on the line is, my, is 2 and 3. We can now use this form of the equation. y minus a known y coordinate equals a gradient, brackets, x minus a known x coordinate. So if we apply this to what we now know, for the line L, y minus, we know it goes through 2, 3. So y minus y1, when that goes through where y is 3, equals the gradient of the line L, which worked out was 3, brackets x minus unknown x coordinate, which we worked out here, was 2, because it goes to the centre of the circle where x is 2. And that will actually be fine. You could leave it like this, because this question doesn't state what particular form to give the equation of the straight line L in. This is absolutely fine. If you wanted, you could rearrange it. So you could say, in, in the form y equals mx plus c, that's the same as y equals 3 times x is 3x. 3 times minus 2 is minus 6. Minus 6 plus the 3, when we add plus 3 to both sides, that would give us minus 3. And so either form of this straight line would be absolutely fine to use. I've done this in a different order to your notes, it doesn't particularly matter, but just to mention here rather than never, in chapter 5 we practice finding the equations of lines perpendicular to a given line. So this idea can be extended to the idea of a perpendicular bisector. So a line perpendicular to a given line segment that also bisects that line segment as well. So in other words, a 
perpendicular bisector, it passes through the given line segment's midpoint and splits it in two equal parts and goes through it at right angles. The concept of a perpendicular bisector is going to be encountered many times when doing circle geometry. Indeed, as we're going to see and prove later, the perpendicular bisector of a circle's chord will always pass through the centre of the circle. Sometimes with circle geometry, you'll be expected to know these facts in order to solve the problem. If you don't know these facts, sometimes it stumps you and you can't move on and work out the solution to the problem. So it's important to know these things. Anyway, let's move forward. Let's think about getting to grips and working out the equation of a general circle. So we can think about how we can express the equation of a circle involving x and y on a coordinate grid. I would suggest the simplest point to start would be the origin. So let's just think about a circle centered on the origin of a coordinate axis. So there we go, there's a little diagram. So if zero, zero is a center of a circle, then by the definition of a circle, all points on the circumference must be the same distance from the origin. Every single point along here has to be the same distance away from the center, which is at the origin. I'm going to label this P. So P stands for point. So P is just any general point along this circumference. I've put it here in the top right for now, but it could be anywhere. So for any general point P, which has got coordinates x, y, the radius r is this distance from 0 to P. Consequently, for any point P, r must be invariant. The radius has to have a fixed value. It stands to reason, it's just common sense. For any circle, r is constant, the radius is fixed. So let's first of all just consider the particular case where we have a circle centered on the origin where the radius r is 5. Let's just think about if we can see what's going to be going on here. So there's this diagram, but now r is 5. So first of all, let's just think of a case where x is 4 and we've got this first quadrant. So x is here in this first quadrant. If you're thinking, what do we mean by quadrant? Quadrant is just splitting up the coordinate grid into four different sections. So the first quadrant is in the top right, where x and y are both positive. The second quadrant is in the top left, where x is negative, but y is still positive. The third quadrant is where x and y are both negative, And the fourth quadrant is where x is positive and y is negative. So we start in the top right and move anti-clockwise to label these quadrants. So one, two, three, four. It's not so much of an issue now, but when we do trigonometry, it becomes really important to know these quadrants. So I'm just introducing this notation to you now. So let's get back to what we're talking about. And so if x were 4 and the radius is 5 and we're in this first quadrant, what would the value of y have to be? So I've just basically pinched this here and labelled it. So we know the radius has to be 5. This has to be 4. What's the value of y? So we know y has to be positive because it's in this first quadrant. We're talking about right angled triangles. We know two sides. We want to know a third. So this is going to have something to do with Pythagoras, isn't it? So y here, well, the size of y at least, plus 4 squared equals 5 squared, just by using Pythagoras. So y squared must be 5 squared minus 4 squared. 5 squared is 25, 4 squared is 16. 25 minus 16 is 9. This implies that y is going to be the positive square root of 9 because y is up here, y is positive, so y is going to be 3. So in other words, our x squared plus our y squared 
equals the radius squared. 3 squared plus 4 squared equals 5 squared. And again here, y is positive as this length is positive. A length obviously can only be a positive value, but let's just be a bit creative and let our imaginations go a bit and imagine that y might be a negative. So rather than thinking of y having to be positive, as long as the size of y is positive, the absolute value, let's now consider if y or x could be negative, just to get this idea across. So first of all, I'm hoping you can see now it links to Pythagoras, and just note here that in this particular case, x squared plus y squared is equal to radius squared. So let's try a different point. Okay, again we're picking x is 4, this time we're picking this fourth quadrant here. So this diagram here is almost exactly the same as before, but now y is going down. So it's still the same triangle as before. So we can say using Pythagoras, 5 squared equals 4 squared plus y squared. Rearrange that, we see that y squared is again 5 squared minus 4 squared, which is 9. And so the absolute size of y is 3. But considering the size, if you like, without the positive or negative being an issue, because y here is now down in the fourth quadrant, what value of y would we have to have to make this work? Obviously the size of this line, the length of this line would be 3, but the actual value, the coordinate value of y, would have to be minus 3. So the implication here is that y would have to be minus 3. We're not saying the length of this diagram is a minus, that would be nonsensical. But all I'm saying here is that if y were minus 3, that would still give a triangle of height 3 and length 4. And again, Pythagoras still holds. y squared minus 3 all squared is 9, plus 4 squared does equal 5 squared. So again, x squared plus y squared equals radius squared. That was the same in case 1, and it's the same now in case 2. So it works even when one of our coordinates is negative. Obviously it works where both are positive, that's for Pythagoras in its most simple sense. How about though, if both x and y were negative? How about if y was minus 4, and we're looking in this third quadrant? what would the value of x have to be? So if I just take this triangle here and put it where I've got some more space to think about it, like so, what's this value of x? And so if I just take this coordinate system and extend the line up, what value would x have to be here? So let's just use Pythagoras yet again to work this out. So 5 squared equals 4 squared plus x squared. So x squared would have to be 5 squared minus 4 squared. Writing's going a bit weird. Let's try and make this up slightly. So that's meant to say 5 squared. And that's meant to say 4 squared. 5 squared minus 4 squared is 25 minus 16, which is 9. So therefore, if we square root, x would have to be either positive or negative 3. But if we look here, x would have to be minus 3 in this case. And again, just check it works for Pythagoras. x squared plus y squared, so minus 3 all squared plus, this is technically minus 4, minus 4 all squared, which is 16, minus 3 squared is 9, minus 4 squared is 16, 9 plus 16 is 25, which is 5 squared. So no matter where we go in the circle, x squared plus y squared 
always equals 5 squared. Why does it equal 5 squared? It's because the radius is 5. So now we've picked the radius being 5, and we can see that x squared plus y squared equals 5 squared. We can extend this for any radius, not just where the radius is 5. So, like I've just said, we can clearly see how each value of x and y must always conform to this particular equation, x squared plus y squared is 5 squared. In other words, x squared plus y squared is 25 by Pythagoras. So we can extend it to generate the formula for any circle centred on the origin with general radius r. This is the general formula for any circle with the origin as its centre. x squared plus y squared equals r squared. At this point, it's just worth mentioning, we're formulating the equation of a circle, not the function of a circle. Okay? The formula for a circle is not a function of x. A function needs to map each x value to exactly one y value. And we can see that this isn't a function by using a vertical line test. So if I were to take a vertical line, so I'm going to colour it in red, say here. Okay, so let's say x were halfway along the radius. It cut the line vertically here, but also as well, if I extend this down, it would also cut the curve below. And so this vertical line would actually cut the circle in two locations. And so if x were, say, I don't know, maybe it's a minus 2, does that map to y as a positive or y as a negative? It's ambiguous, so that's why we can't say a circle is a function. So, just as I've been saying, so generally a vertical line will cut this curve of a circle at two distinct points. So each x value is mapped to two y values. However, with a function, it has to map each x value in its domain to a single y value, not two. So it seems like this might be a bit of a problem, but don't worry. Because this isn't to say, however, that we can't apply some intuition to tease out the general formula for a circle, which is what we're going to do now. Let's start with some intuition from when we talked about graphical transformations in a previous chapter. So let's imagine we have f of x, which has nothing to do with a circle. Just going back to basics, how would we move f of x to f of x minus 3? What would this transformation look like? So what we need to remember, let's get this coordinate grid ready, is if we have an input, in this case x, and then we change this input from just being x to x minus 3, the brackets of an input have changed. So x has changed to x minus 3. The change has happened from inside the brackets, so the change affects the input x in an opposite to common sense way. So rather than knocking 3 off each x-coordinate, we add 3 to x each time. And so this curve here moves 3 along in the positive x direction. And so what we're going to do here is just simply take these points, move them 3 along. And so if I try and sketch this now, not that I'm very good at sketching, we'd have something that looks a bit like this. And so 1 gets moved 3 along 1 plus 3 becomes 4. 4 gets moved 3 along, so the 4 becomes 7. We don't move along in the y direction, we just move in the x direction. So 5 for y stays as it is. This 2 becomes 5. So this maximum becomes 5, 5. And so what happens here in terms of transformations is that the translation of a function three units to the right is what's happened. Let's now consider a circle. You can consider a circle. It's not a function, but it is a formula. So before, with f of x, where the input was x, we can think about there now being two inputs, an input for x and an input for y. So let's see if we can just have an educated guess. If we have this equation here, how could it be transformed to this? And so again, if I just take you back to the f of x example, 
the change happened inside the brackets and affects the input within that bracket in an opposite to common sense way. Here, the same things happened really. And so the x input has become x minus 3. We could imagine, if you want to think of it in terms of brackets, as f of x comma y, where the input is a function, or well, it's a formula really, for x and y. And so it's happened inside this x bracket, and it's minus 3. Because the change has happened inside a bracket, it affects the variable inside the bracket in an opposite to common sense way. So if I get the uh, grid ready, like so, so instead of us subtracting 3 from each x-coordinate, we're going to add 3 on to each x-coordinate. And so it's going to be a transformation, it's going to be a translation of this circle, 3 units to the right, we're going to add 3 to each x-value. And so here it was initially, now we're going to move it 1, 2, 3, like so. And so it's not moved up or down, and so the 2 and minus 2 will still be the height and bottom bit of the circle. However, because we've added 3 to each x-coordinate, the minus 2 intercept becomes an intercept at 1, which is here, and the intercept at 2, we add 3 to that, this coordinate here is 5. The 2 and minus 2 stay as they are. Now let's imagine if the other input changes. So imagine the y changing to y minus 5. This is where we need to use our intuition and make a leap of faith. I'm going to prove this to you more robustly in a moment or two, but for now let's see if we can sort of use and tease out the formula for a circle using the idea of graphical transformations. So, I have this coordinate grid here. I've just shrunk the circle down somewhat to fit it all on. The y has changed to a y minus 5. It's a change that has occurred within the brackets. And so if we apply the same ideas and just use a bit of intuition, if we change the x brackets, it affects the x in an opposite to common sense way. And so if we change the y input and alter the y bracket, surely this will in affect y again in an opposite to common sense way because it changes inside the bracket not on the outside and so y rather than subtracting 5 from each y coordinate we're actually going to add 5 on to each y coordinate and so this circle would move up 5 units so we're going to move 1 2 3 4 five units up to somewhere about that. Obviously it's not a sketch, we don't need to worry about it being too accurate, but essentially the x coordinates aren't going to be affected in this case. So the minus two would still be at minus two, so this edge of the circle would stay at minus two. This edge here would stay at positive two, so we can label those points on. But what obviously would happen is the y coordinates would change. So the centre, instead of being at 0, the centre would now be at 5. The bottom of the circle would be minus 2 plus 5, which would be 3. And the top of the circle would be 2 plus 5, which would be at 7. Well, let's now combine these ideas. What if we had a change in both the x bracket and the y bracket? So x squared plus y squared equals 2 squared, a circle of radius 2, now becomes x minus 3 all squared plus y minus 5 all squared. Well, it stands to reason that because both brackets change, both the x coordinate and the y coordinates would both be affected, and because this change has happened inside the brackets, both would be affected in the opposite way to what common sense might tell you. So x minus 3 all squared means we add 3 to each x value. y minus 5 all squared would mean we add 5 to each y value. And so x, we could move it 3 along, 
then the y direction move it five up and so what this would do here is we'd move it three along one two three something like this and five up and so now we can label on about this new circle where it'd be moved to and so the center because you've moved it three along and five up the center of a circle would now be at three five which you can just label on here and obviously the extreme points of a circle because it's got a radius of two that's going to be at one and this is going to be at five so let's label those on now and the bottom bit of a circle the minimum would also because it's got a radius two that would be three the top would be at seven. So labeling those on just to complete the picture. So to summarize what's happened here, to go from this formula to this one, what's happened is it's a translation of the circle three units to the right and five units upwards. So it's a circle radius two, center three, five. Let's now try and generalize these results. So we minus a number from the origin, that becomes the coordinate, the x-coordinate of the centre. Whatever's in the y bracket, treated as a minus, the minus value is the y-coordinate of the centre. So a circle which is x minus 3 all squared plus y minus 5 all squared has a circle centre 3, 5. So let's now generalise this. So the general form of an equation of a circle is x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared equals the radius squared, where a, b is the center of the circle. So I've shown you that by trying to tease out the ideas of transforming graphs from a previous chapter. That might not be as robust as you'd like. So all we've done here is really just use the intuition where we've made a leap of faith in extending the knowledge from the previous chapter to the Y bracket. So for a few moments it'll take, it only takes a few moments, I'm going to also prove this formula a bit more robustly using algebra and coordinate geometry. So what I'm going to show you now is how you could arrive at this equation without having to rely on the coordinate geometry stuff. So. First, let's consider a circle, general centre A and B, on a coordinate grid. So there we've got the circle, I've put in the first quadrant, the centre, that little dot, centre A and B. So I'm just labelling here A, and likewise for B. Next, I'm just going to draw a general point on the circumference. I'm going to call this point P, which has got coordinates X and Y. So just labeling these on, so X is down here, and the Y coordinate like so. Now we can think about this in a bit more depth. So what's this distance here going to be in terms of X and A? Well, this distance here is going to be the difference in between X and A. In other words, this distance is going to be X minus A. We can now think about the vertical distance between them. So the vertical distance here has to be the difference between y and b. The difference between y and b is just going to be y minus b. This red line itself from the centre to a point on the circumference, that's obviously just the radius. I'm going to call that capital R for now. And so we've actually made a triangle here. So if we focus in on this triangle, just highlight it in yellow. We can now apply some Pythagoras to this. So I'm just going to move this triangle over here and then take it one step forward. 
So just by using simple Pythagoras, I don't know I'm putting simple, could just put Pythagoras, but there you go. So by using simple Pythagoras, we're told that one of the short sides squared on a right angle triangle plus one of the other short sides squared, which is y minus b, all squared, that must equal the hypotenuse squared, which in our case is r, so that's r squared. So that's how we can do it using a carefully constructed diagram and using just simple coordinate geometry. However, here I've done this in the first quadrant. I can promise you it would work if I'd have done this diagram in any other quadrant, but as an extension for you, okay, using a carefully labelled sketch, carefully labelled sketches, you can convince yourself that this is still true no matter which quadrant you were to pick. So you have a go at that, do the diagram in a different quadrant, convince yourself of the validity of this formula for a circle in any quadrant. It is valid, this is always true. So x minus a all squared plus y minus b all squared equals the radius squared for any circle with radius capital R, center A, B. Let's use that formula and apply it in a few simple examples. So work to example four. Write down the equation of a circle with center four minus three and radius six. So if we just use the idea for x minus A squared plus y minus b all squared equals r squared and substitute in the values. The center of a circle, the x coordinate is four and so our a is four. And the y coordinate of the center is minus 3 and so our b is minus 3 and that equals the radius of a circle squared and we're told that the radius of a circle is 6. And so what we can do is simplify this. So we have x minus 4 all squared plus y minus minus 3, that becomes y plus 3, all squared, that equals 6 squared, which is 36. Now sometimes the r squared bit is just left as 6 squared, because really it reads quite nicely. It tells you that's for radius, whereas here it gets lost a bit in translation but because 36, we can easily see that's 6 squared, it's okay to leave it in this fully simplified form. So that's the equation of a circle, center 4 minus 3 and radius 6. Let's try another final one. So we've got a circle with equation x minus 3 all squared plus y plus 4 all squared equals 20. Write down the center of a circle. This might be a one mark question, which is a clue and a hint that this is really simple. Because this equation of a circle is written in this standard form, we can just use the values in this bracket. Whatever is minus is the x-coordinate. So we've got minus 3, the x-coordinate is 3. Here, we've got positive 4. We need to think of this as being minus, minus 4. In other words, the y-coordinate would be minus 4. Another way of thinking about this is whatever sign this number here has just switch for sign. Minus three becomes plus three, plus four becomes minus four. Part B, show the circle passes through five minus eight. All we need to do here is just sub in x is five and y is minus eight and prove that when x is five and y is minus eight, it satisfies this relationship. So five minus three all squared plus minus eight plus four all squared. But it's just a case of simply substituting in our values for x, which is five, 
and our value for y, which is minus 8, and if this point lies on the circle, that should indeed equal 20. So let's neaten this up. 5 minus 3, all squared. Well, 5 minus 3 is 2, so we have 2 squared. Next, minus 8 plus 4 is minus 4, all squared. 2 squared is 4. Minus 4 times minus 4 is positive 16. That does equal 20. So it satisfies the equation. So therefore, we've proven that 5 and minus 8 lies on the circle. And that's all there is to it for now. So, up to you now to get some grounding of these ideas. So if you can turn to page 119, exercise 6c in the pure book. So I want you to try questions 1, A, B, C, question 2, A, B, C, questions 3, A and B, and then 4 through to 7. Again, use the book to help you with checking your answers. If they're not correct, think why they're not and make corrections. If you're still stuck, as ever, do ask me. So have a go at those. Be in touch if you're struggling or stuck or need any questions answered in any way, shape or form. I'll do my best. Thanks for listening again and you'll hear from me soon. Bye for now.